Hi, I'm Jenny Martinez, the Dean of Stanford Law School, and I'm here with Professor William B. Gould IV. Professor Gould is the Charles A. Beardsley Professor of Law Emeritus, and he joined Stanford Law School in 1972 as the first black member of our faculty. He served as chairman of the National Labor Relations Board from 1994 to 1998, and was also chair of the California Agricultural Labor Relations Board from 2014 to 2017. Bill, thank you for taking time to speak with me today. This year, we're marking your 50th anniversary at Stanford Law School. And while you've been retired from full-time teaching for a while, you still regularly do teach our students, which is terrific in areas such as labor law, sports law, and arbitration. Um, I'd love to start by asking you a little bit about how you decided to become a lawyer. What did you think about when you were a young man? Well, uh, I really was prompted to become a lawyer uh, in the 1950s when I was uh, in high school. When I was a senior in high school, uh, there were two major events. One was the uh, McCarthy Army hearings. Uh, my father worked at Fort Monmouth where McCarthy was conducting investigations and that led to these national hearings on television, which I watched every day when I was a senior in high school and uh, followed that up, visiting my great aunt in Washington and going to uh, the follow-up hearings, the Watkins hearings, out of which McCarthy was censured. And the other was uh, Brown against Board of Education, which was decided uh, just before I graduated. And I got the view that uh, uh, lawyers could, uh, uh, as Thurgood Marshall had in that case, uh, play a role in changing society and uh, uh, reducing, uh, in, in that case, societal and r racial inequities. Uh, so those two factors, I think, really uh, made me uh, interested in the law. And how did you end up in labor law specifically? Well, I, I became interested in labor law, I, I think, uh, after Brown against Board of Education, I really wanted to be a civil rights lawyer, but I quickly got the view, this was before the civil rights revolution of the 1960s, that uh, there were very few opportunities available for civil rights lawyers. And I um, had heard uh, Walter, Walter Ruther uh, speak when I was, uh, who was the president of the United Auto Workers, uh, speak when I was a student at Cornell Law School. I was very lucky. I had a professor who had been on the staff of the uh, uh, auto workers and uh, devised a, a problem for us that combined both uh, labor law and uh, racial uh, segregation law. Of course, I dove right into that, and I came to his attention immediately. And as the result of that, he uh, recommended me to for a summer clerkship with the auto workers uh, in Detroit. And uh, that really was uh, the beginning of my involvement in labor law. I sort of uh, uh, had the view that uh, many of the industrial unions, the CIO unions, were pushing for the same things that the NAACP was pushing for, and that was to reduce, uh, to, uh, reduce uh, racial inequities in the workplace. So you quickly gained prominence as a labor lawyer, and in 1967, you were a member of the very first fact-finding board established under the New York Taylor Law. Can you talk about those early years of practice? Well, those early years, I think, uh, are attributable to the fact that I was uh, lucky enough to uh, be with a law firm in uh, New York City uh, where um, one of the uh, leading uh, dispute resolution uh, people, Theodore Keel, uh, was uh, my, my tutor. I set in for him uh, as, a, as a, an arbitrator resolving disputes in a number of major industries where he was the permanent uh, arbitrator, and um, uh, when he was too busy or when he didn't want to hear a particular matter. And as a result of that, I began to uh, arbitrate uh, on my own uh, back in the 60s. And uh, uh, suddenly, at that same time, public sector unions were uh, growing, and the uh, legislature in New York uh, passed a law called the New York Taylor Law, which provided for, among, for, uh, provided as a kind of substitute for the strike in the public sector, so-called fact-finding, where a third party would come in and 
make recommendations, which were not binding, uh, as to how the union and the public employer should resolve their disputes. And uh, I was uh, selected as a result of the arbitration work that I had been doing uh, on this very first uh, fact-finding board established under this new law in New York. And uh, those were uh, terrific breaks for me. And uh, I, I got a lot of exposure at a fairly young age to, to do that. And then after that, you transferred into teaching, into the legal academy. Um, how did you end up making that transition? Well, that was, uh, uh, in a way, a, a kind of an accident. I, uh, during this period of time, I'd been doing a lot of writing. Um, I had uh, certain views about how the, how the law should be changed uh, in the labor management arena, also in employment discrimination. Um, it, particularly relating to uh, um, seniority disputes. I had been involved with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in the mid-60s uh, as a consultant uh, uh, on uh, seniority disputes between black and white workers and did a lot of writing on this. And um, uh, out of the blue, I got a call from uh, Wayne State Law School in Detroit uh, asking me about whether I would uh, be interested in coming to teach. And uh, I, I really, uh, when I remember I flew out there, I, I didn't have a, the view that I would be, uh, be uh, teaching at Wayne State or any other place. Uh, but when I got out there, they, uh, uh, they uh, told me that I could teach what I wanted and I could continue to arbitrate labor disputes and I had a great deal of flexibility. And, uh, you know, that, as a result of that, I. Uh, uh, accepted the offer. We came back to Detroit. This was my second uh, time in Detroit after having worked for the auto workers in the early 60s, and that's how it really began. And then how did you end up at Stanford? Well, again, uh, that was a very similar uh, uh, process. Uh, I was uh, at Wayne State uh, for a couple of years, and that gave me even more of an opportunity to do the kind of writing that I had kind of stored up within me in those years of private practice and arbitration in New York City. And um, uh, as a result of that, uh, uh, Derek Bach, the uh, former president of Harvard, at that time the dean at Harvard Law School, uh, invited me to come to uh, Cambridge and preside over a uh, moot court dealing with one of the articles that I had written, in that case for the Yale Law Journal in 1969. And that led to uh, an offer to come to Harvard as a visiting professor in the fall of 1971. Uh, I remember that uh, no sooner had I sat down at my desk uh, in Cambridge than the phone rang, and it was Mark Franklin from uh, Stanford Law School calling me and saying, uh, would I be interested in coming out to, to Stanford and talking with them about a, a position here? And that's... that's uh, what I did, and uh, as a result of that, uh, coming here in the fall of 71, um, I was uh, uh, given, a, uh, I had a great uh, meeting with uh, Tom Ehrlich, who was the dean then, and uh, with whom I'm still in touch now, and uh, Keith Mann, who was the uh, uh, number two guy and associate dean, and uh, oh, a number of people seemed to be quite interested in the kinds of things that I was doing and writing, and so I accepted their offer, and. Uh, we came here in the fall of 1972, just 50 years ago. Just 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to Detroit for just a second, can you talk about the case in Detroit you argued, which was one of the first racial employment discrimination labor law cases, Stamps versus Detroit Edison? Yes, that, that was uh, an early case. Um, uh, you know, when I was in Detroit, I, I came to Detroit the year after the 1967 Detroit riots. And as a result of that, an organization was put together in Detroit called New Detroit. Uh, it was headed, uh, it was uh, perhaps not headed, but, but certainly one of the principal people was a colleague of mine at Wayne State Law School. Well, he was approached by a number of uh, black workers at Detroit Edison Company who had uh, uh, come to New Detroit hearing of their their work and saying, look, we have a lot of serious problems uh, at uh, Edison. And uh, 
So this uh, colleague of mine said, well, I know the guy that uh, you should talk to because I had uh, just devised uh, uh, an employment discrimination law seminar based upon uh, some of the work that I had done in both Washington and New York prior to the time that I got to uh, uh, Detroit. And um, uh, as the, uh, they came to my office and uh, uh, told me uh, what was going on in Detroit, and it seemed to really fit in with uh, a lot of the issues that I was uh, teaching my students about uh, at Wayne State and uh, beginning to write about. And I uh, had a couple of meetings with them and uh, they asked me if I would represent them. I, I, I remember I was reluctant to do it in the first instance because uh, I was afraid it would take up time away from other things, uh, a lot of the writing that I wanted to do, but uh, I agreed to, uh, to do it and uh, uh, the uh, case, uh, broke some new ground uh, uh, in the fall of 1973. I, I continued to handle it when I got out here. Often I would get on the plane uh, uh, one or two in the afternoon, get to Detroit about 10 in the evening, get to my hotel and argue all day, <laughs> next day in court. I, very, I don't know that I could uh, uh, do that kind of thing today. But uh, at that time I was uh, up for it. and. Uh, uh, we uh, got uh, a number of things uh, that were new at that particular time. We got uh, punitive damages, uh, a punitive damages award for uh, egregious misconduct uh, uh, by the company. Uh, they had refused to even negotiate or talk to us. Uh, we got, uh, of course, back pay, and we got a new concept called front pay. That is to say, compensation for loss of future earnings. Uh, for workers who had been held into low-level jobs. We got seniority credits that, uh, uh, where they had accumulated seniority in the lower-level jobs to which they had been consigned as the result of uh, the company's practices. And uh, beyond that, we uh, got uh, goals and timetables for future hiring and, uh, and promotion. Uh, it, was, uh, it took a long time. Uh, we, uh, uh, it was challenged before the Court of Appeals in Cincinnati. Some of uh, the decree was taken from us by the Court of Appeals. I argued against uh, former Secretary of State uh, and uh, the Attorney General William Rogers. Mm -hmm. My co-counsel here said to me, uh, Bill, when you get in front of those guys, remember that uh, you're going to have to do a very good job because uh, uh, Rogers has probably appointed, is responsible for appointing <laughs> Uh, a good many of them, and uh, uh, we did lose uh, some of the decree up there in Cincinnati, but uh, we were able to hold on to it and uh, to uh, ultimately, uh, after a good deal of uh, trench warfare, uh, obtain the highest per capita uh, settlement that uh, had ever been obtained at that point. It's since been, of course, uh, uh, overcome by uh, other cases involving many more employees. It was, it was quickly overcome by the AT&T case, but uh, uh, we got uh, uh, $4 million for uh, approximately 400 uh, employees, and uh, we got uh, a handsome attorney's fee award, which I had to hand over to the American Civil Liberties Union because uh, they had financed this litigation due to a good pal of mine, Mel Wolf, who was their legal director, and said, I'm going to finance your litigation, allow you to control it, but if you are successful, I want you to remember me and the attorney's fees part of it. So that's the, so it was a long struggle, and uh, but I felt uh, as though I had made some uh, contribution to making uh, this part of our uh, society a little better. Wow. So, Bill, you've been an extraordinarily influential and productive scholar with more than 60 scholarly articles, countless op-eds, and 11 books. Uh, and I've, we've got this beautiful um, poster of your books, which really just show the sweep of your scholarship over the years. Um, I'd love to talk about your latest book. Um, it's called For Labor to Build Upon, Wars, Depression, and Pandemic, and it's a really fascinating and thorough historical analysis of American labor law. Um, you have so many interesting themes in the book, but I was particularly struck by this connection between democracy in the workforce 
and democracy and society that you make. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, I, I, um, I think that uh, uh, a very important part of uh, a democratic society uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, free, free trade unions. Uh, the concept of uh, freedom of association for uh, workers, where workers are able to uh, not only resolve uh, grievances in the workplace, uh, but also uh, obtain a sense of uh, dignity uh, and to uh, participate uh, in, uh, uh, at the table with uh, employers. And I, I say in the book that I uh, believe that never in our history has uh, uh, this been more important than today in the year 2022, in the wake of uh, the events of January 6, 2021, uh, where uh, uh, really uh, the most uh, basic assault was made upon our democracy uh, since uh, the Civil War of 1861 to 65. And uh, democracy in the workplace is important that unions, uh, notwithstanding their many failures, which I've written about in this book and elsewhere, uh, uh, are, are an important instrument uh, for uh, promoting democracy and that unions can uh, play a role in the political process themselves and uh, that this ought to be uh, furthered. And I say some things about how the law should be uh, uh, adjusted to, do, to address that. I get the sense right now that there's a sort of renaissance among young people, especially in paying attention to these issues. Have you noticed students more interested in these topics in the last few years, let's say, than 10 or 15 years ago? I, I do, I do. You know, uh, um, when I first came here, uh, I, uh, my classes uh, were consisted of uh, maybe uh, 70 to 80 people, uh, uh, which uh, I know at some law schools doesn't seem like a lot, but <laughs> in our law schools, a relatively small one, it is a, a fairly uh, big uh, uh, body, student body. But um, uh, that, that number has uh, declined uh, over the years as uh, unions have uh, declined. And uh, I uh, noticed particularly in the last two times that I uh, taught the course, uh, uh, 2020 and also this spring, 2022, uh, that uh, suddenly there is a great deal of uh, upsurge uh, in the uh, numbers of uh, students who are interested. Uh, uh, I think in my last class there were about uh, 50 or so, which was quite different from uh, uh, maybe uh, 10 or 20 years ago when labor was really uh, at its uh, nadir uh, in, in uh, terms of work organizing and representing workers. So I think there's a, as there has been uh, uh, at least uh, some indication of a revival, I think the the jury is still out on whether uh, there is a true revival. I think there, there's been a uh, revival in the interest uh, of our students. Why do you think this moment in society has provoked that revival? Well, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I got interested in writing this book uh, for labor to build upon because uh, I felt for uh, a number of years that uh, the way in which uh, we labor law scholars had uh, uh, looked at the decline of labor and talked about the possibility of revival had been too law-centric. We all recognized that there were many factors which had led to the decline above and beyond the law, which of course is, uh, as I've maintained in a number of my writings, is uh, imperfect to say the least. But um, um, I think that uh, 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 we, we've, uh, many of labor law scholars have said, oh, if we can just change the law, that will change everything. And I became interested in um, uh, where and when unions had uh, had periods of growth in the past. Uh, uh, and uh, those periods are periods of a great uh, uh, uncertainty and um, uh, a great deal of uh, upheaval as a result of that, uh, wars, World War I, uh, World War II, and the Korean War as well, um, where labor is called upon, and, uh, uh, and the Depression, uh, the desperate circumstances of the Depression, which were unsettling to, uh, to say the least. And um, I uh, 
uh, had been thinking about working on this uh, book for some period of time, begun to write it, and then along came the pandemic, uh, a new period of uncertainty. And uh, the subtitle to the book is Wars, Depression, and Pandemic. Um, and uh, what I tried to do was to look at uh, the factors which uh, uh, produced uh, uh, union growth, uh, uh, self-help, uh, uh, strikes, uh, the use of uh, resources uh, to organize the unorganized, um, cooperation with uh, uh, war, World War II, World War I also, agencies that promoted uh, labor. And I came to the uh, conclusion uh, that uh, uh, these were the kinds of factors which induce uh, change. Not that law is irrelevant, but uh, in, uh, I, uh, I think that uh, there is a symbiotic relationship between law and these other factors. But uh, uh, I think that uh, law is subordinate uh, to uh, so much of what goes on in society and uh, produces uh, change. And so that's the kind of thing that made me uh, write this book. And those are the themes which I, one of the basic themes which I develop in it. So the U.S. has seen more of a decline in union membership than some other countries, right? So what accounts for that in your view? What, what's the difference between... Well, I, I think that um, uh, the a fundamental difference is uh, uh, the uh, uh, hi historic uh, uh, kind of Horatio Alger story, the idea that uh, the individual can uh, uh, make it on his or her own, not recognizing that uh, government has always played a big role in promoting uh, so much of what has moved the country uh, uh, forward. And uh, I think that, uh, but, I, but I think that, uh, uh, you see, we had a, a lower uh, a base uh, to, of, of union representation to begin with compared to most other countries. Uh, we went down. The other countries, except for Scandinavia, uh, the Scandinavian countries, which have had a slight dip, have gone down as, uh, as well, but I think that uh, uh, the roots of that uh, lie in this uh, deeply held uh, notion that uh, uh, everybody has to make it on their own. And uh, I uh, think that uh, uh, you know the, uh, the that we us uh, has been so important, have been so important in uh, the development of. Uh, the things that we think are important uh, and that have endured in American society. I think unions uh, can be and are part of that. One of the things you've written about over time are some of labor's failures in areas such as racial and gender equality. How does that fit into the story of, of labor over the last Well, decades? I think that uh, race has been uh, uh, an enormous uh, problem uh, for unions. and. Uh, if we look, again, if we compare the United States with Europe, um, uh, we find that uh, one of the reasons why uh, Europe has a, uh, the European countries have a more uh, comprehensive and effective social safety net than does the United States is the fact that in their period of development, uh, their proponents of change were not immobilized by uh, racial division. And uh, there's no doubt about the fact that the uh, uh, that racial divisiveness has held the trade union movement back in this country. Uh, uh, I, I mentioned the Detroit Edison case that I was involved in, um, uh, where we had to uh, sue the unions as well as the employer because of the fact that they were complicit uh, in, uh, in racial discrimination. And, and uh, in this period, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, much of the litigation, much of the pressure was focused upon the labor union uh, active, active misconduct in some areas and uh, or acquiescence uh, in, uh, in uh, inequity in other areas. Um, the, uh, I think that in recent years, um, particularly as uh, uh, blacks and other minorities and women have begun to move into uh, uh, sectors that, uh, where unions have historically uh, had uh, representation or tried to have representation, the unions have begun to uh, adopt, uh, in some instances, uh, a different stance. And I think herein lies uh, one of the hopes for uh, 
the labor movement in the future, uh, uh, particularly if they, if they take on in an activist way, as some of them are from time to time, uh, uh, this, this, this uh, business of uh, racial inequity in our society. So you mentioned the pandemic as a sort of moment of upheaval like past wars and depressions that really focus societal attention. And one of the things we saw a lot of in 2020 and 2021 was the sort of situation of, of gig workers, of the gig economy. Um, they received unemployment protections for the first time and compensation. What's the state of the law now with respect to gig workers and where do you see those kinds of employees going in the future? Well, the, the state of the law now with regard to gig workers is, in my judgment, uh, 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 an unfortunate one. The uh, uh, gig workers are still uh, removed or on the periphery of uh, the benefits that other workers enjoy uh, in, our, uh, in our country. The, uh, uh, here in California, uh, the California Supreme Court just a few years ago, uh, uh, in a landmark opinion, the Dynamex opinion, promoted the inclusion of gig workers in the central economy. The legislature followed, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the major companies that were affected by this, uh, rather than accommodate themselves to it, went to the uh, ballot box in so-called Proposition 22 and used uh, an unprecedented amount of money to uh, really reverse uh, the dictates of the, uh, both the, uh, the holdings of the Supreme Court and the legislature. Uh, in this uh, in this arena, this problem of uh, atypical employment, uh, uh, the uh, uh, sometimes uh, we refer to uh, workers as contingent employees, uh, workers who uh, uh, do uh, part-time work in more than one particular job, is one which has uh, really uh, uh, challenged us. And I think uh, thus far we haven't uh, effectively. Uh, uh, address this. Uh, some legislatures have, in Washington State, for instance, have tried to make an accommodate, so establish a compromise, but uh, uh, bringing these workers into the mainstream, which I think we must do as part of our struggle against uh, inequality in the United States, is uh, thus far on the to-do list and not something that's been accomplished at this point. Do you think that it's harder for those workers to organize precisely because everything about their jobs is so tentative and contingent? Oh, no doubt about it. Uh, also because uh, uh, in the case of uh, you know, some of the prime examples of this in Uber and Lyft, uh, uh, the workers don't uh, come in touch with one another. Uh, they, uh, uh, of course, many of them have been uh, very effective in uh, co cooperating and, and uh, communicating with one another through uh, new electronic uh, means and through uh, apps and the like, uh, but uh, uh, they're, dist they're more distant than uh, in the traditional workplace and, uh, and uh, they're, they're spread out over uh, large portions of territory and it's been very hard for, uh, for the unions and uh, very hard for society to uh, uh, dive into this problem because of this. We've seen a lot in the news about workers who are working together in Starbucks or in Amazon um, and some organizing campaigns there. What do you make of that? Is that sort of, is that a meaningful trend or is it just the sort of thing that gets news headlines um, when, when it happens in one or two places but doesn't build to something that is more society-wide? Well, I think it is meaningful. I think that uh, uh, one of the uh, interesting things and uh, from my perspective encouraging things about uh, Starbucks for instance is the fact that you have a number of very young, uh, relatively uh, well-educated and principled people uh, involved in this effort which is a, a, tough, uh, a tough business. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, in the 1930s uh, so many of the CIA, the new the new kid on the block was the, the CIO unions, the Cong Congress of Industrial Organizations. There was no bureaucracy uh, holding back uh, uh, the uh, new organizing as uh, has so often been the case where, oh, we have to spend money on this or that and, and uh, uh, let's put all of our money in the strike fund, which is rarely tapped into. 
and could be used for organizing. So I think that the Starbucks example is uh, an important one. Whether it, it shows a, uh, a real change or not, I think the jury is out on because uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the question is going to be whether or not uh, unions are able and willing to uh, seize this opportunity. It's a great opportunity for, for, for unions. Uh, we see organizing uh, amongst, uh, uh, in the newspaper rooms, uh, the new tech companies, uh, uh, even Google, uh, places where organized labor has feared to tread. And uh, I think that uh, there are many developments, but what we don't see thus far is a reordering of priorities, a reordering of expenditures by the unions to devote resources to organizing the unorganized and, and, organized, and to make way for uh, some of these young people to uh, promote them in the, uh, uh, in the trade union structure itself. One of the most interesting things that's happened in this regard is not only uh, Starbucks, but also the Staten Island the Amazon plant where uh, an independent union uh, that used some of uh, the existing union's expertise and technical help, uh, but uh, they uh, move forward on their own. Uh, graduate students here at universities, uh, now regarded by the National Labor Relations Act uh, Board as employees within the meaning of the law. Uh, so many of them are, are I think, uh, getting the help of uh, traditional unions but trying to strike out on their own, creating their own structure. And I think that this is hopeful, but uh, we, we, are, we are still in early days and we don't know whether uh, uh, this will lead to a real uptick uh, in, uh, in union membership and to a uh, re-involvement in uh, trade unions in our society and in this country. Mm. So what do you think uh, what do you think the union should do to better allocate their resources to foster the growth that you're talking about? Well, I think that they have to have, uh, they have to cooperate with one another to begin with. You know, uh, I talk about my New York City days. Uh, I remember working for this uh, uh, guy, Ted Keel, who was always called upon by Mayor Wagner, the son of Senator Wagner, the author of the National Labor Relations Act to uh, come into major labor disputes. And he said to me, uh, you know, uh, there's only uh, one group that the uh, unions hate more than the employers, and that is each other. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so, so often there's not enough cooperation with unions. I think that unions have to cooperate in, in combining uh, the funds that they have, the assets and the uh, strike funds they have, and uh, to... Uh, uh, put it under uh, some kind of umbrella. There was a movement about 20 years ago called Change to Win. It didn't go very far. And uh, cooperate with one another and uh, promote uh, this as the priority. In the 1930s, we had John L. Lewis, of course, who became known for uh, coal disputes, which uh, were very important in the country at that time. Uh, but the other thing that he was important for was uh, uh, involving, uh, promoting uh, the organization of workers in automobile and steel and rubber and aluminum, the basic industries which labor hadn't paid any attention to at all until the uh, 1930s. And he was able to do that because labor put its financial resources uh, into, into the fray and uh, put its money where its mouth was. And uh, that's really what has to happen today. Law reform shouldn't be forgotten, but law reform uh, is, is uh, uh, at best symbiotic and uh, fundamentally subordinate to these kinds of reforms. Mm -hmm. Well, say a little bit about the law reform, as you say, subordinate to these other societal and organizational factors, but what are some of the legal issues that might need to be addressed? Well, I think the major problem that uh, we have in labor law today is that uh, is, is twofold, uh, uh, and there are many things that flow from this. So one is the administrative process. Uh, the administrative process is, if the parties want it to be, uh, broken. Um, uh, it moves uh, so slowly uh, that uh, the average uh, 
a guy or gal who's concerned about uh, uh, justice in the workplace uh, is likely to throw up their hands in despair, uh, waiting for uh, uh, or the various layers of dispute resolution that are built into the uh, legal system uh, uh, to, to play out. And uh, uh, the, uh, so, you know, when I was chairman of the NLRB, we got involved in the baseball strike in 1994-95. The reason we were able to, uh, uh, to do that was that we have a mechanism in the statute which is uh, infrequently used. We used it more than any other NLRB has used it before or since. Uh, and that is a, a provision which allows the NLRB to obtain temporary injunctive relief while the administrative process is being exhausted. And uh, the, um, um, we, we, uh, that's what we were able to do in baseball, and that's why we were able to uh, get the players to come back to the field and get the owners to accept them and to get uh, uh, peace and, and uh, uh, we were hopeful that uh, this would serve as a, uh, an illustration for other parties in other relationships. So administrative process is part of it. The other problem in, in law reform is the uh, unavailability of effective uh, remedies. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, we have uh, remedies which uh, I tell the students are kind of a a slap on the wrist, a, a go thou and sin no more. Um, and uh, where uh, back pay, the traditional remedy, has become kind of a, the cost of doing business. And uh, uh, it's built into uh, uh, conduct that, uh, if uh, found illegal, really doesn't matter because uh, uh, it'll be so difficult for uh, uh, the status quo ante to be uh, uh, promoted under such uh, circumstances where uh, the process has gone on. So it's the combination of the uh, unavailability of a good administrative process as well as sanctions. Uh, the, the, our antitrust law has uh, trouble damages, criminal prosecution. Um, uh, it, you know, employers have to pay attention to that uh, in the boardroom. Uh, uh, they don't have to pay as much attention to the National Labor Relations Act because uh, the remedies available are so appreciably inferior. So mentioning the baseball strike brings to mind one of your other areas of expertise, which is sports law. Um, you really helped to create and pioneer that field, and there's generations of law school alums who studied with you. Um, uh, you had some incredible visitors to your class over the years, including Willie Mays. Uh, what drew you to sports law? What's the, what was the connection between that and your other areas of scholarship? Well, I think initially, uh, you know, I, uh, I, uh, I love sports. I, I, uh, I play as a kid. Um, I thought I was much better than it turned out I was. <laughs> I played baseball daily uh, in San Lot. You know, we, we used to ride our bikes down to this field we call the station field. Our mothers made sandwiches for us, and uh, we played every day, morning and afternoon. We talked about baseball. Uh, uh, we, we, we listened to baseball. It was before television. We listened to baseball on the radio. and. Uh, we, uh, we lived and breathed uh, baseball. We'd go to all the local games. Well, uh, suddenly along comes uh, in sports uh, uh, unions, uh, and uh, they are, uh, uh, begin are beginning to uh, use the law. My sons used to say to me, uh, uh, gosh, you know, we hear about uh, uh, these matters involving the National Labor Relations Act. You, you should be... Uh, this is your uh, area, this is your domain, you should be involved in this. Well, um, uh, a good pal of mine, uh, a fellow named uh, uh, Bob Berry, at, uh, who went on to Boston College Law School, he and I were pals at Wayne State, and we kept saying he was, uh, he was somebody who'd done a lot of work in contracts, and we said, we gotta kind of put our, our, our expertise together and do some writing, and we did. Uh, in, the, uh, in the 70s and 80s, in the 1981, we wrote a piece called The Long Deep Drive to Collective Bargaining, which kind of <laughs> summed up uh, uh, the, the, the confluence of these two uh, considerations. Well, here at Stanford, um, 
uh, I uh, became uh, very friendly with uh, two guys who uh, kind of complemented my uh, uh, technical uh, uh, knowledge in this area. One was a fellow named Leonard Coppett, who was a, had been with the New York Times and was the editor of the Peninsula Times Tribune, and, and Alvin Adels, who had been an outstanding uh, player with the Golden State Warriors and, and uh, the coach of the Warriors, general manager. And we became good pals, and we said, hey, we got to put something uh, together. So in the mid-'80s, we began to put together a uh, seminar. I, I put the materials together, and uh, uh, these guys, uh, uh, adults, could talk about his own personal experiences in the area. Coppett knew a lot of people. You talk about uh, uh, guests who came to our seminar. Uh, one of them, of course, was the the late Bill Walsh, who uh, came a number of times and uh, uh, was uh, very helpful. We had the leaders of the uh, unions and uh, the representatives of the uh, clubs. Uh, we even had uh, uh, Willie Mays come to the class. I remember the day that uh, uh, he came to the seminar. Uh, it was like electricity going through the, the law school. You know, the kids were so excited. and. Uh, uh, we had a uh, great time with him. He came up to my office and said uh, he saw that I had a Bobby Bonds glove up there. Barry Bonds' his father he used to play for the Giants. And he said, that glove is no good. I'll get you a real glove. And he did. <laughs> and I still uh, have it. I, I, it's so lovely that I haven't, oh. uh, haven't used it. So we have a lot of great memories. And those guys, uh, we were all so different uh, in terms of our uh, backgrounds, also physically the way we looked, because of course Mr. Leonard Coppola was Mr. Five by Five, and Alvin Adels was a really big fellow uh, uh, with a deep voice and uh, that resonated through the hallways. And uh, I was, you know, I don't know how I fit into this. And uh, everybody got a kick out of these disparate personalities and That's physical true. shapes and behavior. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the chapters in your new book is about sports, and especially amateur sports, college athletes. What's going on in that area right now? Well, the, there have been a lot of uh, important developments in that area uh, very recently. Uh, uh, suddenly, just within the past couple of years, the Supreme Court, uh, this uh, uh, rightward-leaning uh, conservative Supreme Court, has uh, uh, a year ago interpreted the Sherman Antitrust Act in a way which... Uh, gives uh, uh, college players, uh, uh, so-called amateurs, a great deal of leverage in obtaining benefits above and beyond uh, reimbursement of tuition and ordinary expenses. And uh, out of that has come, uh, simultaneous with that, has come uh, a great deal of state legislation aimed at uh, providing players uh, the ability to, uh, to get uh, uh, benefits uh, uh, O'Bannon down at UCLA uh, uh, found out uh, one day that uh, his image was being used by the university um, to uh, sell um, uh, video games and the like, and he didn't even know that uh, the vid these uh, video games existed, let alone not being uh, compensated for it. And so I think the feeling is that uh, uh, by, the, by many of the players, and by no means all of them, uh, that uh, uh, there's an imbalance here, that uh, uh, the, the, the uh, great revenues that have been obtained by the universities uh, uh, through the attractiveness of, uh, of uh, a number of uh, sports uh, uh, are not being shared with the uh, players. And uh, uh, the national, my old agency, the National Labor Relations Board, has also uh, become involved in this and uh, now has cases before it uh, maintaining that uh, just as the gig workers uh, are being misclassified as independent contractors rather than employees, so also uh, these uh, athletes are being misclassified and not characterized properly as employees. And uh, the NLRB general counsel has uh, uh, indicated her wish to, to pursue this uh, before the labor board and the courts. Uh, this is going to take some years, but uh, I think that uh, this is uh, one example of the 
kind of uh, new relationship, the atypical relationship which uh, uh, employees have suffered from um, because of an imbalance uh, where there are attempts to uh, remedy this, in this case, through uh, both labor law and antitrust law. Speaking of the NLRB, can we talk a little bit more about your time there and especially uh, your role in resolving the baseball strike, that you were at the eye of the storm. I'd just love to hear a little bit more about what that was like. Well, that was a, a, a very uh, uh, challenging period for, for me, uh, Jenny. Uh, President Clinton won the election in 1992, and uh, an old pal of mine, uh, Jack Schenkman, uh, whom I had known since my Cornell days, um, uh, flew to here, flew in here to San Francisco, and we had uh, breakfast together. And he said, uh, "I think you should uh, be in the Clinton administration. What do you think you would like to do?" And I said, "Well, you know, I, I've really been interested in labor policy." He said, "No, I think that uh, you should be chairman of the National Labor Relations Board uh, because uh, you spent uh, much of your life uh, not only on arbitration." But on this, uh, this statute, and uh, you've, a lot of your articles and books have focused upon it. And he put my name forward to the then president-elect, and he told me, called me back, he said, I think that he's very much interested in it. And then I heard nothing until Herb Cain, the San Francisco Chronicle, wrote a piece in the spring of 93 uh, saying that you can bet the farm on it, that uh, Gould, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Gould is going to be... Uh, named by uh, Clinton as uh, to the NLRB, and he, he did, and I encountered uh, uh, great resistance uh, uh, in the Senate. Uh, at that time, I got, I was confirmed not until the spring of 94. Uh, Paul Brest uh, came to my aid, and uh, they, they had told me, I'll be, come here, you'll be in Washington in the summer of 93, and of course, here I am with, Telling Paul that I, I've got a department. Paul said, "Don't worry. You know, you can. We'll we'll find some things for you to do, and you can uh, sit tight." And and um, I uh, was here until the spring of uh, '94 and got the most number of no votes ever obtained by uh, Clinton uh, nominee. Now, uh, since then, soon thereafter, others exceeded my record, and of course, these days there are many who exceed my record, but. Um, that this was a period of uh, where the filibuster ha was just being introduced into nomination disputes. And uh, it was really uh, uh, the greatest uh, manifestation of uh, this new period of polarization between uh, uh, extreme polarization between not only labor and management, between Democrats and Republicans. And... Um, uh, we uh, had a, uh, a, real, uh, a real challenge, and uh, uh, I think that uh, everything that happened during those four and a half years in Washington, which I, I was glad to have participated in, nonetheless uh, was the mirror image of that deep divide, uh, uh, the uh, uh, divisions within the board, uh, disputes that uh, normally would be contained there, um, and uh, I felt that at times I was uh, rushing down to Congress, over to Congress on Capitol Hill, to uh, testify in congressional hearings more than I was in my office writing the decisions which uh, the taxpayers were paying me to, uh, to do. Well, that was uh, the way it was, and of course, the one, uh, one of the shining moments was this uh, baseball dispute where... Uh, uh, we had the longest uh, uh, dispute in baseball history uh, in August of 94. Uh, the players had uh, gone on strike. My friend Leonard Coppett, when I, when I went to Washington, my friend, I said to Leonard, I said, you know, Leonard, one thing I'm, I really regret about going to Washington is that uh, uh, I, I'm not going to be able to arbitrate baseball disputes anymore. I have been arbitrating some salary baseball disputes between players and owners. And he said, don't worry. He said, you're going to be involved in something much more profound 
uh, than that, much more important. And, and uh, he was right. Uh, uh, we became involved as uh, other mediatory efforts uh, broke down. We became involved uh, in this dispute and uh, uh, heard the, the positions of both sides and uh, ultimately made a decision to proceed to federal district court to uh, then judge, now Justice uh, Sotomayor, uh, mm -hmm. who uh, issued uh, an injunction uh, uh, in our favor and enjoined the owners from uh, uh, proceeding with uh, unilateral changes that they had made in the conditions of employment. And uh, once that was enjoined, uh, the players said, we'll return. And uh, the owners said, we'll take them back. And then ultimately that led to the negotiation of a series of collective bargaining agreements, uh, which brought them uh, uh, uninterrupted peaceful resolution of disputes until this year, 2022, <laughs> until the lockout of 2022. Well, that's a long period of stability. Uh, what do you think accounts for uh, 2022 being a break in that? Well, I think that um, uh, the, um, what's happened in the, uh, some of the recent agreements uh, is that uh, uh, the players have um, uh, seen uh, their share of the pie uh, diminish. Um, uh, they agreed to restrictions on free agency uh, in the, uh, uh, in the teens uh, prior to this agreement, and they grew uh, increasingly uh, restive. Um, uh, international, uh, the international recruitment of players uh, 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 at one time uh, providing a great opportunity for the players because uh, owners were falling over themselves, uh, giving uh, multi-million dollar uh, salaries to uh, people who were coming from other countries, particularly from the Far East. Uh, the owners were trying to restrict that and to uh, make that a, a part of the, uh, the draft system, which means that you can only bargain with one club. And uh, then uh, something else happened as well, and that is that the baseball owners noted uh, with great interest that uh, in football and basketball and in hockey, um, the uh, uh, owners have become increasingly successful through the use of um, the lockout. Um, and the lockout is important because uh, the owners found that if you take the initiative uh, in, as the season begins, uh, you hurt the players um, and, uh, uh, most and hurt yourself least uh, uh, as opposed to allowing the union uh, to wait until near the end of the season when you really need them more than ever because the postseason is the time when you have the greatest public interest and the greatest uh, 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 revenues. And, uh, uh, you know, some of my uh, early articles, uh, a piece that I wrote in 1967 uh, in the Cornell Law Review focused upon the importance of timing in the use of uh, disputes. And uh, that's what's happened uh, uh, here, is that the owners have uh, uh, zeroed in on the fact that this is the weapon we should use, putting the players on their back foot, so to speak, and uh, making uh, 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 more of the advantage, and uh, putting more of the advantage in the hands of the owners. Mm. Well, in addition to your work at the federal government with the NLRB, you've done a lot of work at the state and local level with the California Agriculture Labor Board, with state bar groups, with uh, this, the, the mayor of San Francisco recently. Could you talk a little bit about some of that work at the state and local level and the role that state and local government plays in some of the issues that you're interested in? Well, the, the work that I did for uh, the mayor of San Francisco is probably the most recent of these. It, it in a way, flows from my involvement in uh, racial discrimination uh, uh, earlier. She asked me to uh, come in and to uh, 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 provide a report, which I, which I did with the very able assistance of uh, a couple of great Stanford law students, I, I might add. and. Uh, uh, we, uh, uh, I have earlier not only been involved in this litigation, but 
done dispute, acted as an arbitrator in employment discrimination cases. So she asked me to come in and to uh, write a report about uh, how things could be improved in racial inequity in, in the San Francisco city workforce. That sort of flowed from uh, this earlier work that I uh, uh, described. Uh, in the 1980s, um, I was the, uh, named by the California Bar to be uh, a chairman of an ad hoc committee recommending uh, changes in wrongful discharge law. You know, uh, uh, until the late 70s and early 80s, uh, there was no way that an employee could challenge uh, dismissal or discipline in the workplace unless it violated uh, race, sex, re uh, national origin, religion, or, or the right to in be involved in a union in the case of the National Labor Relations Act. Um, but now, suddenly, the uh, judges uh, in the 70s and 80s began to fashion a new common law, independent of legislation. And uh, uh, I uh, chaired a committee here which uh, made comprehensive recommendations uh, uh, about how this should be uh, uh, changed. Uh, this is a problem that uh, continues to this very day because it's kind of been uh, um, uh, subsumed into uh, uh, the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Federal Arbitration Act of 1925, through which uh, the uh, court has allowed employers to unilaterally promulgate their own dispute resolution procedures, which have trumped uh, the use of uh, fair employment law, wrongful dismissal law, and uh, uh, Congress has, uh, I've been one of those who, who've uh, promoted the idea that Congress should legislate and reverse what the court has done. But in a way, the, uh, the battle has uh, moved away from uh, 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 new legislation on wrongful dismissal into uh, the Federal Arbitration Act of 1925 uh, with, with uh, 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 that there have been statutes uh, enacted uh, like the ordinances uh, enacted like what we've recommended here in California. I've been involved recently with a group of lawyers uh, that, it's attempting to, uh, that are attempting to get uh, uh, a New York City ordinance uh, uh, preserved against constitutional challenge. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the Agricultural Labor Relations Act. Um, uh, the, uh, Agricultural Labor Relations Act of 1975 uh, was enacted uh, during Governor Brown's uh, first uh, period as, as governor of California. Cesar Chavez uh, played a, uh, uh, of course, uh, played a role in, principal role in uh, bringing farm workers together, demanding uh, rights from uh, uh, growers, and eventually cooperating with Governor Brown in enacting the statute. We thought it was a dream statute. You know, the farm workers and the domestic employees also have been uh, excluded from uh, the, the mainstream, excluded from uh, the National Labor Relations Act because, um, uh, really, because uh, uh, they're disproportionately uh, consisting of black workers at the time and now black and brown workers. And uh, in the case of... Uh, uh, domestic work, of course, uh, overwhelmingly women, um, and uh, they didn't have the juice to be part of the regular legislation, but uh, the, uh, as a result of what happened here in the 70s, we got this Agricultural Labor Relations Act, and um, the uh, problem uh, has become that uh, uh, the uh, uh, union membership, which was at its high in the 1970s, has declined here uh, precipitously, more precipitously than it has throughout uh, the economy. Um, I got a call uh, in, um, uh, in 2014. I remember I was down in Southern California. And it was during Thanksgiving or Christmas. I got this call from the governor's office. And I thought, they said, we want to talk to you about the Agricultural Labor Relations Board. I, so I began to, my mind began to race, thinking of my students, which mm. I thought they were calling me about uh, recommending one of my students for a, 
a position, and I was trying to think, which of my students can spring loose? No, they said they wanted me to be chairman of the uh, Agricultural Labor Relations Board. And I said, no, you know, I'm, I, 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 you know I, I, that's, a, uh, that's a bridge too far for me at this point and uh, doing some other things. And I, my wife said to me, you know, wouldn't you really <laughs> enjoy some of, some of the, our friends said that she just wanted to get me out of the house and uh, <laughs> back to Sacramento. And wouldn't you really enjoy uh, uh, this, uh, you know, get the, uh, the juices flowing, you'd be back doing a number of things that you were doing in Washington. And after a couple of weeks, and my wife is the one who's come up with so many of the great titles for these, these uh, books. She's, what should we name this book? And she comes up with great ideas. And she said to me um, that, uh, you know, you really ought to think about this. And so I, I did. And I called them back and I said, is this job still open? And they said, yeah. I said, well, you know, maybe I'd be interested. All right, come in. I said, how do you think the law can be improved? I said, you know, this is a dream statute. Are you, uh, who am I to say that uh, this law could be improved? Well, um, uh, I, uh, when I got there, I found out uh, some of the problems that existed. It was a very challenging uh, period. I, I, uh, um, uh, it was, uh, I, I, and of course, I used to get on the Amtrak uh, train and uh, go to uh, Sacramento uh, 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 once a week and take off on Sunday or Monday and come back on Thursday or Friday and uh, stay at, they would put me up at the Sheridan Hotel and walk back and forth across the street to the ALRB offices. It was a great, uh, it was a great challenge and uh, uh, a great learning experience as Washington was also. I think that uh, one of the things that I uh, uh, have uh, enjoyed the most about these experiences, both Washington and Sacramento, has been uh, the fact that I can kind of bring this back to not only my writing, but to my classes and uh, uh, engage uh, my kids who, uh, 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 you know, who are somehow you know, pop up and are very much interested in uh, uh, real life uh, situations and uh, what President Clinton said and what Governor Brown said. Uh, Governor Brown uh, would uh, frequently invite me over to his office and he said, you know, we, I've told them to put aside our, and we would talk for hours. And uh, he would, uh, he began many of these discussions uh, talking about other things. I remember that one time I was in his office when the Supreme Court had handed down a decision on environmental protection. I thought he was uh, ducking me and didn't want to talk about all of the Agricultural Labor Relations Act problems. No, that just, uh, it just that the subject we were talking about, the environment, just consumed the first half hour or so. Then, then we could talk about the Agricultural Labor Relations uh, Act. And so in contrast to Washington, where I only saw President Clinton socially, and uh, they were very careful to preserve uh, the arm's length relationship that exists in Washington between, or should exist, between independent administrative agencies and the presidency. Uh, uh, Governor Brown uh, would have me over and tell me about all the things that he had done previously prior to the time I had arrived there. and. Uh, and also sometimes tell me what he thought I should do. And I told him that uh, even though the uh, Agricultural Board does not enjoy the same independence that the NLRB does, that I was going to nonetheless proceed as I wanted to. But I, I learned a great deal and I enjoyed that process. And I, I like to think that uh, the kids here in my classes uh, um, uh, derive some uh, educational benefit from those experiences. Well, before we, before we wrap up, I, I want to talk about one of your books on a very different topic, which was um, about your, your family and your ancestors, Diary of a Contraband, The Civil War Passage of a Black Sailor, which includes passages from your great-grandfather's diary. How did you come to write that book? And, and tell us a little bit about what, what you found. Well, uh, my, my father, uh, you know, I, I 
when I was a child, we would, we, I was born in Boston, but we lived in, we moved to New Jersey. My father was working at Fort Monmouth, uh, the place that McCarthy investigated. And um, uh, we would go back during the summer to uh, Dedham, Massachusetts, immediately south of Boston, where all my great uncles and aunts lived. I don't recall talking to them about uh, my, their, their mother and father um, at all. Uh, I think my father had some conversations with them. My father was a young man when my great-grandfather uh, died. They lived right near one another. In 1958, one of my, one of my last great-uncles to die uh, bequeathed all of his property to, to my father. My father went up there and found in the attic this diary that uh, uh, my great-grandfather, the first William B. Gould, had kept while in the Civil War um, between 1862 and 1865. And he brought it back and he would, I can see him now sitting in the living room reading it and he said, this is something you really ought to pay attention to. You ought to read this. We discussed it. I did read it and we began to talk about uh, uh, doing something together on this diary. It was so unusual. Here was a black man who, uh, it turned out, I was to learn later, had escaped from slavery. Uh, and uh, they had taken a, a boat and gone down the, uh, uh, the Cape Fear River in Wilmington, North Carolina. I didn't even know that my great-grandfather was from Wilmington at this particular uh, point. And uh, they joined the United States Navy, got on one of the ships, and he commences this diary uh, in the fall of 1862 and keeps it until the day of his discharge in Massachusetts in 1865. Uh, and uh, at that time, my father and I, uh, there was still, there was nobody alive who was, of course, uh, uh, on this earth at the time of all of this, but there were still people who, who had, you, who remembered being told things by other people. Mm -hmm. We were trying to run a few of these people down, but we're all with all these other things to do, and you know the the kinds of things we've been talking about here uh, recently, and and uh, we never got around to it. And then I, after my father's death, I began to uh, go after this in a more systematic way, and I looked at, um, went to uh, back to Massachusetts, and uh, uh, I was visiting at Howard Law School in the fall of 18, 1989, and. Uh, uh, went to Massachusetts, went down to Wilmington, North Carolina for the first time I had ever been there. And John Hope Franklin, who visited here, the historian, uh, stayed at his house the night before I went to Wilmington and he said to me, uh, I, wish I, could, I wish I could be there with you. I, w I would like to walk the streets of Wilmington with you, looking for, looking for this man. And, uh, that's the way it was. I knew no one in Wilmington, and uh, uh, gradually, uh, uh, through census records, uh, uh, slave owners' property, the, the logs of the ship, uh, uh, other correspondence, uh, uh, I was able to uh, organize this diary and uh, annotate it and uh, write uh, four, five chapters uh, uh, with it, uh, ex trying to explain uh, this man and the time and circumstances in in which he w which he w lived, uh, he um, uh, was a man whom I'd heard a little about from my father when he was alive, uh, mainly because he had uh, done the he became he was a plasterer, a tradesman. Um, in Wilmington, I went to a seminar. And I was admiring the tap tapestry and uh, uh, the uh, plastering work in one of the most lovely antebellum mansions in Wilmington. And then a few months later, people called me and said they had found uh, some pieces of plaster with the initials WBG for William B. Gould on the, in the plaster. And um, so this is where he... Uh, th this is where he uh, learned this uh, 
uh, this trade uh, in conditions of slavery. And he then went to uh, Massachusetts at the end of the war. Uh, he married my uh, uh, great grandmother. Uh, he had known her. Uh, they were they were enslaved together in Wilmington. She had been purchased out of slavery and taken to Nantucket, corresponding with her during the war, uh, and uh, uh, settled there and then became a, uh, uh, a leader in the uh, community, uh, one of the few, maybe the only black family in Dedham at that point. He became a leader in the Grand Army of the Republic, the Civil War Veterans Organization, uh, and uh, helped found uh, uh, the local Episcopal Church, the Church of the Good Shepherd, uh, and uh, uh, was a and, and did the work on this uh, Roman Catholic Church, which cathedral-like church, which can be seen for for miles. So uh, uh, this was a long uh, process uh, that went over uh, many uh, years, and the result of it was this book in 2002, uh, Diary of the Contraband, which I think. Uh, Probably, uh, I like to think, we all like to think our books will last longer than our, our lives, but I think that one probably has the, the, uh, the greatest uh, possibility of doing it for a number of years to come. Wow. Well, Bill, you've been on this faculty for 50 years, half a century. You've seen so much, and you've influenced so much. Um, it feels like we're at a moment of historical importance. I know the students ask me questions about whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic about the future of American society. Um, so I'm going to ask you that question. You, you've seen so much. Now we're at this moment that we find ourselves in 2022. Are you an optimist or pessimist about where the country's headed? And what would you tell young people about that? Well, I would tell young people that uh, um, uh, th they can, just as William B. Gould did in the, in the Civil War, play a part in uh, what are truly uncertain, fragile uh, times, my goodness, when we see that uh, the Supreme Court has before it in the year 2022, a case involving the question of whether a state legislature may uh, establish unilaterally all the rules relating to an electoral process. We know that uh, uh, this is a fragile uh, situation, but I think that uh, uh, the answer for uh, young people uh, and the answer for us in society is to, to as, as William B. Gould did in the 1860s, to put one's shoulder to the wheel and try to uh, move this society in the, in the best direction possible. You know, the, uh, um, I feel I've been very lucky in life and uh, I feel that uh, these students uh, who are extraordinarily capable and sometimes uh, confident uh, have been lucky in life to be here at Stanford Law School. They have, to those whom uh, much opportunity is given, much is expected. And I think that uh, uh, although I'm fundamentally, I suppose, uh, agnostic on uh, this kind of issue as I am about a lot of things, uh, uh, I think that uh, we have to try to uh, make the best of this un very uncertain perilous circumstance that we live in and uh, move our society forward. I think we can, as we did in the 1860s and the 1930s, um, do that. Well, thank you, Bill. It's been an honor to hear your insights from your long career. And so thank you for taking the time to talk with me. And I look forward to hearing your wisdom and having our students learn from you for many years to come. So thank you and congratulations on this 50-year milestone. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks very much.